This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name's Jane Winters. I'm Head of Publications here at the Institute of Historical Research. And on behalf of the IHR, I'd like to welcome you to this, which is the first of three events examining the relationship between historical fiction and particularly the novel and academic history. I know that many of you are joining us for tomorrow's conference, and next week we're holding an experimental virtual conference, which is a departure for us. This will allow people who are unable to attend in person to hear some of the presentations, but we also hope it will be a forum where you can carry on the discussion from the conference and develop some of the ideas and arguments that emerge today and tomorrow. Uh, there will also be specially commissioned articles, reviews and so on, so I do encourage you to register for free for that next week. And there are details about how to do that on a postcard in your pack. Uh, but returning to this evening, we're enormously privileged to have with us Hilary Mantel and Professor David Lowes, who are going to be talking about researching and writing Tudor history. And the responsibility for chairing the session lies in the expert hands of Paul Lay, who is the editor of History Today. So we'll get the proceedings started and I'll hand over to Paul. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear? Uh, is the mic sufficiently loud? Um, welcome to the uh, Institute of Historical Research's Winter Conference, uh, Novel Approaches. Um, this is a hors d'oeuvre, I suppose. It also serves as a banquet, um, because we've got um, two uh, speakers who really don't need much of an introduction. Uh, on my left is Hilary Mantle, the man Booker Prize winning author of War Hall, and two other exemplary historical novels, A Place of Greater Safety, um, which set during the uh, French Revolution, and has certain parallels, I think, which we might talk about later with uh, Warhol and the giant O'Brien set in the 18th century. Warhol was originally intended as the first of two historical novels, but it's now part of a trilogy, and that's, <laughs> and that's become apparent just in the last couple of days. <laughs> The second of which, Bring Up the Bodies, which I think was originally called The Mirror and the Light. Is that right? No, well, The Mirror and the Light will be the third book. Ah, oh, right, okay. okay. And that will be published in May, that is, Bring Up the Bodies will be published on May. Um, and on my right is Emeritus Professor of History at the University of Wales, David Lodes, honorary member of the History Faculty at the University of Oxford. He studied under Geoffrey Elton at Cambridge, which I think might be pertinent uh, during this discussion. <laughs> and he's written a great number of books on the Tudor period. I can't possibly name them all, but they include the biography of Henry VIII, and recently the Tudor Queens of England, published by mm -hmm. Continuum. And his most recent book is especially relevant to this discussion, which is The Bowmins, The Rise and Fall of a Tudor Family. Now, David and Hilary are going to make a short presentation, and then we'll have a discussion. Um, I know it's a very engaged audience, um, so we'll, we'll leave plenty of time for a question and answer session, um, at, at least half an hour, I would imagine. So, um, David, would you like to start? Thank you very much. Well, first let me thank the organisers of this colloquium for an opportunity to take part, and say what a privilege it is to be sharing this session with Hilary Mantle, whose work I, I well know. It will be an exaggeration to say that we're old friends, but well, we are acquainted and share the platform at Hampton Court not very long since. And thanks also to Paul Lay for chairing. Let no one accuse history today of pervading historical fiction. <laughs> Many thanks, I also owe thanks to Alison Weir who encouraged Jane to invite me and to Jane for inviting me to, do, to, to come along. So why am I here as a professional academic historian? I should say from the start that as a professional historian I don't read historical novels, at least not very many. I rarely watch historical films, um, the ones that you have seen, uh, or the television series indeed, which you would also be familiar with, much more familiar than I am doing. Now the difference between the professional historian and the writer of historical fiction is one of priorities. 
Nowadays, more than ever, the medium follows the line of the late businessman, business tycoon James Goldsmith, who's the father of Jemima and so, being examined by a US Senate committee. He said, I know of no other reason for being in business except to make money. Now, how does this fit in with my first question? Do the writers or purveyors of historical fiction have a responsibility either to the discipline or to the readership or to their viewers? The question is important in respect of films and television presentations, which are more readily posted into the minds of the general public than books are, I think, on the whole. Television series The Tudors, for example, was historically absolute nonsense. I saw various openings which were absolutely ghastly. <laughs> In a review, I, collect, I recollect that my professional colleague, the jo uh, Professor John Guy, who was the husband of Julia Fox, of course, um, said that everyone in uh, the Tudors was about 28, um, which is a comment on the construction of the play, <laughs> I think. But it was apparently geared to an American market, which would need the Tudors to be spiced up. <laughs> Never the Tudors needed spicing <laughs> up. Uh, in The Other Berlin Girl, Mary Berlin is almost entirely fictitious. And while I commend Alison Weir's new and persuasive reconstruction, my colleague Eric Ives has said, what we actually know about Mary Berlin could be written on a postage stamp with room to spare. I don't entirely agree with that, having made a chapter on Mary Berlin in my latest effort, but uh, nevertheless he has a point. The chronology of events is treated with great freedom, so that everyone believing, anyone believing that this is an authentic record of Mary's life is going to be somewhat seriously deceived. The activities of Anne and the timeline are inaccurate, almost beyond belief, except that this is, of course, is fiction. Now, as if I, have, if I have heard correctly, the original book was tinkered with to create a good film, and the author has a, a bigger responsibility to make sure that the, the book is authentically represented. On the other hand, A Man for All Seasons, was based on an ancient work now, was based on R.W. Chambers' biography of Moore. Presents Moore as a good, decent lawyer, an honourable courtier, and a man with a great sense of humour. It misses out the bit that it was Moore who initiated the plan of making people stand in boiling oil as a moment a matter of achieving a confession. Uh, to say nothing of his, uh, his uh, vituperation against William Tyndall, of course. But it shows a reasonably authentic Henry, set in a legitimate historical context, so that anyone believing that fiction wouldn't stray very much beyond the bounds of legitimate historical disagreement. There are endless disagreements among historians about exactly what uh, Thomas More's nature was, what Thomas Cromwell's nature was, or indeed what Henry VIII's nature was, if it comes to that personalities at the forefront of many disagreements. So I would say that there are those who write pure fiction, where an historical period is simply treated as a canvas on which to paint events which never happened and people who never existed. The period may be authentically handled or not. It varies according to the nature of the book. This kind of fiction goes back to the days of Sir Thomas Mallory, I think, whose Maud D'Arthur presents a picture of Dark Age Britain closely resembling the 15th century in which he was writing. And the romantic knights of the round table wore contemporary armour and indulged in Burgundian style jousts. So you don't read Thomas Mallory if you want to know what Dark Age Britain was like. Camelot would hardly have been recognised by anyone from 5th century Britain. But it made a good story. The works of this kind in novels in the full sense and don't differ very much from crime or romantic stories in a period setting, like The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes or Miss Marple or Hercule Poirot, set in the 1920s. I think that Sir Walter Scott's novels, like Quentin Durwood, come into this category, 
uh, what Walter Scott didn't know about the Middle Ages would fill several libraries. <laughs> Moving up the scale of authenticity, there are those authors who accept a broad historical context but fill in the circumstantial details. This usually means inventing fictional characters, giving them invent invented careers and adventures which fit in with the context of actual events. It may also mean taking up, making up biographies for real people about whom little information survives. Now I have put uh, W. Harris Mainsworth's Tower of London and his old St. Paul's into this category. The Tower of London, incidentally, uh, I discovered subsequently, having read it as a, as a young teenager, uh, was based upon the, uh, the Chronicle of Queen Jane and the first two years of Mary, which had been published by the Camden Society about two years earlier. Uh, therefore, in a sense, it is authentic history, but he makes up the personality of Stephen Renard in a very dramatic way. And his old St. Paul's is a series of stories woven around the plague and the fire of London in 1665-66. Now, Philippa Gregory also comes in at this point. The other queen, Mary Queen of Scots, featuring a love affair between Mary and George Talbot, for which the real evidence is extremely exiguous, not to say non-existent. Now, after taking these, anyone taking these stories at face value is being deceived, I think, but only at the detailed level, and I don't think any serious distortion of the period really results. More authentic still are those writers who steer, as it were, into the interstices of established historical facts, making judicious use of disagreements between historians, of course. They only invent where no authentic record survives, creating and structuring minor personalities and sequences of events made plausible by the general accuracy of the context. This is often done <clears throat> by making use of extensive use of invented dialogue, which may be spiced up with authentic quotations from letters and other sources. In my judgment, Hillary's Wolf Hall comes into this category because her reconstruction of the characters of Thomas Cromwell and Cardinal Wolsey are plausible, if controversial. They are, in other words, authentic. The fiction here lies mainly in the family background and the supporting cast, who are, for the most part, real people, but given invented personalities and a lot of invented dialogue. It must always be remembered that the main object of the writer of any historical fiction is to tell a good story, which will grip the readership, which takes us back to James Goldsmith and his making money, of course. Philippa Gregory's website makes this point succinctly. Too many historical novels, she writes, are like tapestries, detailed, finely wrought and colourful, but essentially static. Things happen to these needlework queens and kings, courtiers and common folk, but they may remain lifeless figures, and they put me to sleep. Well, that is her view of that situation. I wouldn't entirely agree with that, but never mind. In other words, the job of the historical novelist is to entertain, and no didactic responsibility is normally accepted. So it's a question of caveat emptor. The reader needs to be aware of what's being offered is more fiction than fact. Now, historians also differ in their approaches. The nearest to the writer of historical fiction is the popular historian, who is concerned to make a period or a sequence of events more accessible to the general reader. Such writers are often what might be called tertiary historians, dependent to a large extent on the researches of others, but making extensive use of printed sources, often of a literary or narrative kind. Many of their interpretations are spiced with words such as it must have been so. They tend to be a bit garble about contemporary opinions also. For instance, I accept or the tendency to accept George Cavendish or George Wyatt at face value, Cavendish's Life of Wolsey, which was written about 30 years after the Cardinal's death. George Wyatt, whose memories of Sir Thomas 
were written in the early 17th century, many, many years after Thomas's death. So they tend to be a bit gullible about opinions, but they don't invent. Now I would place Alison Weir and Julia Fox in this category, and also the more recent works of David Starkey. The object of these historians is also to tell a good story, but they don't stray beyond the bounds of what is sustainable by scholarly research. They are in the sense of the opposite extreme from the writers of fiction, in that they fully accept their responsibility to make authentic history as entertaining as possible. I place some of my own work in this class, most notably the Berlins, which sets out to tell the truth, to tell the truth about these often fictionalized people. Academic historians are also different. There are root searchers who are mainly concerned with historical antecedents or recent problems or institutions. The so-called Whig historians preoccupied with ideas of progress and the evolution of parliament were probably the best known of these, but Marxists, feminists and others with ideological agendas also come into this class. They are authentic historians, all right, but they tend to be subjective in their use of evidence. The late Professor Geoffrey Elton, to whom we all raise our hats, who supervised the research of both myself and David Starkey, interestingly enough, at Cambridge, accused him of writing history backward, and that was it was unstinting in his condemnation. He described him as committing the sin against the Holy Ghost, I seem to remember. But many insights have resulted from their efforts. Economic history would not be the same without the Marxist input, nor modern perceptions of the role of women without the feminist pioneers. Such ideological approaches to the past are not very fashionable nowadays, they'd be largely discredited, but nevertheless they serve their purpose in their time. Secondly, there are those who love a fight, who are never happier when they have discovered some scrap of evidence which overthrows a long accepted theory. History is made up of these theses, of course, some of them so well established that we accept them as facts. Who would nowadays deny the date of the Battle of Hastings or the effects of the Norman Conquest? However, others are more controversial, and it is among these that the battle rages. A good, but, but rather old, example of this is the assault made by Hugh Trevor Roper on the ideas of R. H. Tawney concerning the rise of the gentry in the 16th and 17th centuries. More recently, the attacks of Christopher Hague and Eamon Duffy on the Protestant interpretation of the English Reformation, particularly the works of Geoffrey Dickens, show the same tendencies. All historians have to start from somewhere, and many start from research intending to re-examine well-established points of view to standard practice of PhD supervisors to set topics of that kind for their students. This approach, therefore, tends to be characteristic of the young or the pugnacious, and their work is aimed at their fellow professionals rather than at the general reader. Now, there are also consensus builders, those who seek to avoid controversy by hedging their bets. They tend to be cautious about accepting new evidence and seek plausibility rather than certainty. Such historians are also suspicious of isolated pieces of evidence, particularly if its provenance is uncertain or suspect and of opinionated contemporaries, particularly ambassadors. It must always be remembered that ambassadors had their own agendas and did not set out to answer the questions which modern historians wish to ask. I think that most of my own work comes into this category, in fact. Such writers are always very conscious of their responsibility to an educated general readership, as well as to their colleagues. Now, historians also operate in different ways. Some men work mainly in archives, discovering or reinterpreting record material, such as the King's Bench plea rolls or church warden's accounts. I would place Paul Cadwell's recent study of Henry VII's parliaments, or Steve Murdoch, Steve Murdoch's work on Scottish maritime warfare into that slot, who may or may not be familiar with those words. Such historians often produce their best work in the form of articles in learned journals rather than monographs, and their readership is limited to students and fellow professionals, very largely, that is. 
Others work mainly in libraries, using literary rather than record sources. Some of this literature is in manuscript form, of course, but most of it is in print, often in learned editions of the 19th century. One of the best examples of this style of writing is provided by A. L. Rouse, who expressed contempt for those who buried themselves in record offices, but who nevertheless brought literature and history together in an innovative fashion. Rouse had an extensive popular following, particularly in the United States. And such historians can be no less original than the archive-based variety, but their originality tends to lie in interpretation rather than in discovery. And most historians, in any case, feature in more than one category in their careers as their careers develop. David Starkey is a case in point. Beginning as an archive-based researcher working on Henry VII's privy chamber, he has since operated in every class, being now a high-profile popularizer with a significant television presence. But David is under no delusions that his remit is to tell the historical story as it was, making it relevant to a 21st century audience. Entertaining with the truth might well be his motto, but that doesn't make him a writer of historical fiction difference between the historian and the writer of historical fiction is one of priorities. The former accepts a responsibility to be true to the record, where the latter is primarily an entertainer who happens to use a historical period as the context of the story. Now, of course, I base my observations mainly on the Tudor period, because that is one that I know about, and I tend not to stray very far from what I know. However, I would be surprised if my generalisations didn't apply equally to other periods and to other countries which have a similar balance of historical resources and public interest, it would be said. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, thanks for that um, overview. Um, we're in quite, quite an extraordinary overview, actually, because it makes us realise just how little time we have and how much ground there is to cover um, in historical fiction. It's interesting that people always talk about the Tudors as the nadir of historical television, I think. And I've only ever met one historian who thought they could make a case for it. Um, if we had more time this evening, I could probably try and make a case for Spartacus, Blood and Sand, which might be <laughs> uh, controversial, but, but we don't have time. We call that books the Tudors. <laughs> anyway, um, now, let's hear your man's help. Thank you, Paul. Um, I, I am honoured to be invited to an event like this, to share a platform with David, to attend an event by Paul. It wouldn't have happened a few years ago. One of the revelations to me after I published Book 4 was that by and large, although historians might not agree with my interpretation of events, on the whole they weren't hostile to the whole enterprise. I have thought they would be. Um, I expected to be some sort of intellectual rapper because you know, when I went back, I, I first published historical fiction in a, around 1993, my book on the French Revolution, and people had no hesitation in denouncing it without having read it because it was fiction, therefore worthless. Thankfully, the climate has changed. But I'll tell you why historical novelists and dramatists become moral lepers. And I cut this letter out of The Guardian yesterday. Um, it's from a barrister. I said, the first instalment of the new series of Garrow's Law showed William Garrow, habitual advocate for the underdog, defending the madman Hatfield accused of high treason for shooting at George III. It was a travesty. The heroic defender who secured Hatfield's acquittal was not Garrow, but Thomas Erskine. Garrow was indeed involved, but as junior counsel for the Crown. So his role was precisely the opposite of the one the BBC assigned to him. And the writer goes on to say, the BBC's charter and its producers' guidelines say all programmes should be fair and show respect for truth. 
the producers of Gallows Law, Sherlock at it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's just a brilliant <coughs> basic point, though. I can't help thinking that the writer is really being sweetly naive in expecting the BBC to rally to the defence of truth um, at the expense of dramatic licence. I'll tell you what I do, I'll try to tell you where I draw the lines, where I think fact and what happens when fact meets fiction. I'll tell you first of all how I came to historical fiction. It was out of exasperation. I wanted to read a book that didn't exist. So, you know, as Disraeli said, um, when I want to read a book, I write one. <laughs> so it was rather like this. When I was a child, before I was allowed my adult library tickets, I used to read my mother's Jean Pladies and all the rest of it. And those anachronistic ladies on the cover with the pointy headdresses with veils um, at the back and their bosoms hoisted up and their lipstick on. Uh, and this was historical fiction in those days, certainly as it was presented to me. It wasn't this that interested me first in history. Um, I think the breakthrough for me actually came when I was 16 and I read Bridgerton and the rise of capitalism, on whether Tony was right or Tony was wrong, I suddenly realised that history was more than one damn thing after another, <laughs> and that it was about ideas as well as personalities and events. And I had noticed, well, two things really, that historical fiction was an unrespectable genre. Um, and let's not mince words, it was for girls. It was, it was regarded largely as women's literature. And this did nothing for its status. Um, but if you read a wonderful book like I, Claudius, you didn't say that's a historical novel, you just said that's a novel, that's literature. We drew this line somehow. Things have changed hugely since then. But when I began to write historical fiction, it was... Um, it was a settling for something. I, wrote, I, I did it out of a sense that I'd been stupid. I thought I should have read history at university, and I didn't. And so I missed my chance. So how could I work my way in? Well, I'd have to set up a set and best, and I'd have to become a historical novelist, which, which meant you were set and best to a historian and set and best to a real novelist, because I had no idea how to make up plots. And, and so I began work with this kind of cultural cringe. Um, as an, I was an inferior subspecies, um, but at the same time, I had no hesitation in setting my stall out for a project that would take me years. And I was completely prepared to read all the historians, read all the source material I could get at. But because I had not learned history properly, because I was only equipped with schoolgirl history, what I wasn't prepared for were the silences of history, the erasures and the gaps. And I had an incurable dislike of making anything up, so I was at a complete disadvantage. And it took me years to learn how to cross the barrier between fact and fiction, or how to fudge that barrier, how to knock it down, how to nip around it. Um, and we all pick <coughs> our eccentric path. I remember, you see, I will make up the thoughts of a man's heart, but I will not make up the colour of his drawing room wallpaper. <laughs> I have much rather move the action to his study, where I know what colour the wallpaper was. <laughs> and I, I once had a conversation with the novelist Lawrence Norfolk. Um, we both agreed that, that on the feeling of security, 
it gives you. If you know what the weather was doing on a particular day in history, and how much we disliked making up heavy cloud cover when there might have been bright sunshine. Now, traces of my cultural cringe, my abject thinking, remain now. So, I'm not so much terrified of large mistakes, because I know that historians make them all the time, <laughs> careering off after daft theories, um, and maybe coming back repentant after a period of years. But I am terrified of the kind of small mistake uh, that will enable people, the real people, like David, to point to me and say, actually, it didn't happen on a Tuesday. It happened on a Wednesday. <laughs> Somebody with a PhD was never made that <laughs> <laughs> um, And therefore, my methods are labour intensive. Um, I think all the time of the details. And I let the art, if there is one, somehow take care of itself. Therefore, I don't make large claims for historical fiction. It is historians who enable me to do my work. My work is the work of synthesis, discrimination, <coughs> comparing interpretations, <coughs> choosing between versions. It's not about original thinking, and it's not about primary research. I'm standing on the shoulders of historians, and I'm, I'm indebted to them. But I don't think a bit better of my own trade than I did when I started, because I can see how that if it's done properly, with attention to the history of ideas as well as the history of material things and institutions, it allows the reader's imagination to picture not only material conditions different from today's, but different mindsets, different models, different values. I think that's what it should do. But the reason I was so turned off by historical fiction when I was a girl, and I, I must say, I think this is still the case with a lot of historical fiction, is that the writers simply dress up 20th century or 21st century figures in the clothes of the past. The costume is different, and everything else is the same. And I don't think you really can do that. These novels were and are often centred on female figures. And what I see now is that they're often vehicles for moral teaching about women's lives. Um, I've obviously brooded on this a lot since I took on Henry VIII and his wife because I think that an element of that carries over and because we're dealing here with huge archetypes and that's the reason why the material takes still, after all these retellings, takes such a grip on modern readers. And of course all historical fiction is creation of the moment it's written in. Um, we can't alter that, and it can come to our aid. The meaning of our own text changes as, as current affairs evolve. I wrote in, in, my, in my new book, there's a line where someone says to Thomas Cromwell, you're a Lutheran. And he says, no, I'm a banker. <laughs> and of course, the, <laughs> the implications and ramifications of that have hugely changed <laughs> since, since I, I, I put those words down on paper. Um, what I was meaning there is that um, what he's saying is owing to Luther's stern condemnation of lending money at interest, is he likely I'm a Lutheran? But of course, he means much more suddenly. I do not think, however, that historical fiction is simply a coded or disguised way of writing about the present. I'm always being asked by journalists to speak about the parallels between then and now, as if the past had no value in itself. I think it does. And 
The other question, how much of this is fact? As if there were two neat categories, fact and fiction, and the danger confronting the historical novelist is that she might mistake one for the other and pass off um, work a sort of confidence trick on the reader. I like to write about real people and real events, but if I were to try to disentangle fact from fiction, for example in, in Wolf Hall, I would have to footnote every line because I don't, I like there to be an actuating cause, a line, half a line, behind anything I make up. And even if I did footnote every line, I couldn't pinpoint, I couldn't pin down for you the sort of alchemical process by which fact metamorphoses into fiction. But I can, if it should be relevant, I can give examples of the sort of thing I'm talking about. It seems to me that the first requirement for a novelist is, a historical novelist is honesty. Historians rely on hindsight. It's their tool, they can't do without it. But sometimes, as has been said, it corrupts them. Empathy is the equivalent for historical novelists. We can't do without it. And sometimes it corrupts us. So we have to be examining our own processes all the time. But I'm clear that the truth, if you can get it, is always more interesting than anything you can invent. And so for me, invention is something that fills the gaps. It sketches a shape into those erasures. And if there is a conflict between the truth as it is and the truth as you would like it to be for dramatic purposes, then the real, the real thing must win. Because, well, we come back to the Tudors. As soon as you lie or distort, you set in train. A, a, a series of consequences it ends up in farce so if you look at what the Tudors did on TV um, they thought it was too complicated for the viewer if Henry had two sisters so they rolled them up into one and called her Margaret and this meant because they also distorted the timeline of the French monarchy they had to invent a new king for Mary stroke Margaret to marry and so you get further and further from anything resembling the true record. Because one fabrication, um, it, it just trip, one falsification trips another. And on by the same token, they decided they couldn't have too many geographical noblemen. We couldn't have both Norfolk and Suffolk. <laughs> so most unwisely, they decided to drop the Duke of Norfolk one of the outstanding figures of Henry's reign. And this is not just historically bad, it's dramatically ghastly. Because this is the man who, you know, you miss all the fun of having a man who plays a major part in the downfall and execution of not one, but two of his nieces. How could they resist him? <laughs> Although I have to say, uh, I was particularly fond of the bit where Cardinal Wolsey took Cardinal Capeggio by the ear and dragged, dragged him across the room. <laughs> uh, I played that bit over and over again. <laughs> but leaving aside the Tudors, which takes it to farcical proportions, if there is a conflict between dramatic neatness and the unshapely, ugly truth, I think you should discuss it with the reader. You can't now write a historical novel in the old, unself-conscious manner. You have to write a historiogra historiographical novel. Um, it seems to me we're best to show our workings, discuss our problems with the reader. And what 
we must do is understand that we are part of a chain of literary representations. So the Thomas Cromwell I created in Wolf Hall is really not a descendant or relative of the real Thomas Cromwell, so much as he's a descendant of Thomas Cromwell of the Book of Martyrs, or Thomas Cromwell, the, the trickster Cromwell, of a, a truly awful Elizabethan play about him. It's truly awful, but it's very funny. He's, he's the playwrights, um, or playwrights, have equipped him with a sort of comic manservant, and they go around Europe like Blackadder and Baldwin. <laughs> and it's one of those plays where the, the playwright suddenly realises that he's had the audience standing there for three hours, and we've only got to the fall, fall of Cardinal Wolsey, so he has to wrap everything up in ten minutes. Um, when I wrote my novel about the French Revolution, one critic said, the French Revolution is a great theatre, and at the moment, a place of greater safety is playing. Now that exactly catches my sense of it. Um, it's a process by which new generations make demands on the same old material, and if you're the artist who's shaping the material, it should come up new and fresh for you every time. And so new and fresh for your audience and your reader. I have written a book now about the few months between the death of Thomas More and the death of Anne Boleyn. If you, the, obviously the fall of Anne Boleyn is one of the most contentious, most mysterious, and the most hair-raising episodes in English history. And if you read 20 different historians, you will get 20 different accounts, maybe not differing on the facts, but giving different weight to the facts, inflected differently, always the stories told differently. But there's always something, it seems to me, of the, there's something unaccounted for, as if there's a little bit of territory that is still unmapped. And it seems to me that what we're dealing here, what we're here, is the activated power of rumour. It's very hard for a historian to discuss or pin down. Where you have a conspiracy, the important conversations are by the nature of the thing off the record. And it seemed to me that at that point, you see, where the court turns into a great cauldron of sexual politics and power politics, you, you have to raise the question with the reader, the question of evidence, and not make it part of a narrative overview, but make it part of your plot. Um, what I can do is operate in this, this off-the-record area. Um, so much history now, so much fashionable Tudor history, <coughs> is about the iconography of the court. It's, it's about pageantry, it's about painting, it's about the gift-giving culture, and so on. Traditionally, this, this is where what historical novelists are interested in, what is demonstrated and what is shown. But I am much more interested in what's going on on the back stair, or the word behind the hand, uh, that which cannot by its nature make itself onto the record. So I can't produce any new truth about this episode. What I might be able to produce is some insight. And I might be able to make my reader feel what it was like to live through those terrifying days. And that really is 
the largest claim I'll make for historical fiction. The historian will look backwards and tell you what happened. But I will walk you forward with the characters who don't know the end of their road. And I will try to ground you with their bodies so that you may be able to imagine what they experienced. When I wrote my novel, The Giant O'Brien, I, I quoted some lines from the poet George Macbeth at the beginning. All quit from skulls and bones who push the pen. Readers crave bodies, and we're the resurrection men. <laughs> Which is neat and it's powerful, but being a resurrection man was not a safe or a respectable trade. And if you go in for it, you have to do it with due respect for the fact that the ground at any moment might give way beneath your feet. <laughs> When you say that, uh, by its nature, conspiracy is off the record, because exploring that aspect, that lost aspect of history, or that misplaced history, um, takes us back to two of the central characters in your novels, Cromwell and Robespierre. Um, it, it's funny because even, even before Wolf Hall was published, I'd always had, or wanted to have, a soft spot for Cromwell that was prompted by the two paintings of Holbein that sit above the fireplace in the Frick Collection of New York, where you have on one side, you have Cromwell, born to the purple, almost confident, at ease, cosmopolitan. And then on the other side, you have Cromwell, who doesn't look an attractive character, but is a shrewd character that seems furtive in some way, paranoid, one might say someone who was highly attuned to the idea of conspiracy and gossip. And I, th I think that's one of the most fantastic achievements of Wolf Hall, is it makes that apparent, and that is something that a historian cannot do. And I think in many ways, the superior historical novelists, like Hillary, because let's face it, um, not all historical novels of that quality, um, but the best ones, and the public that buys it, 225,000 copies in hardback, to a certain extent, are ahead of the academic historians, or many academic historians in this, because it focuses on what really is cutting edge um, history at the moment, which is the history of emotions, I think. Mm -hmm. The sort of stuff that John Arnold is doing, uh, people like Tom Dixon and Rodri Hayden. And um, I wonder if David might well, yes. Uh, I mean, the historian, uh, the nature of things, cannot analyse the nature of emotions in the past um, because it is dependent upon written records and traditions. And these very commonly don't record that, or at least record them in a very slanted kind of way. That somebody was very angry in certain circumstances. Well, you've only got the word of the author who wrote that book that this person was angry. They might have been distressed, they might have been upset, they might have been had some quite different reaction. Um, but you're dependent upon the written record for the evidence. And uh, therefore, it's quite impossible for the historian to enter into the personalities of uh, historical characters in the same kind of way that the novelist can do. Um, a novel has no footnotes. <laughs> no. If it did, then they'd be as long as the text itself. Yes. I mean, you try to explain to people what series of conjectures wrote you to, uh, brought you to writing a particular line. Yeah. It, a very, very complicated trail. And somewhere, There'll be a sort of skip in the heartbeat. There'll be a skip in the logic yeah. because you won't be able to explain your intuition, uh, 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 which, which is the thing that you. There is no formula for it. 
But it, what happens is, I think, um, there's, a, there's a particular pleasure, and for me, I think it's the greatest pleasure, in, in seeing the fictional possibilities of fact. Not how can I exploit fact to make a more dramatic version, but there are things so good you absolutely could not make them up. But sometimes you don't come across them easily. <laughs> you, I, can I give a for instance? Okay. I mean, in 1535, there's a petition to Henry VIII, which I imagine might have crossed Cromwell's desk. It, it's from a private man, otherwise unknown to history. And this man is putting his grievance before the king. He says, those were winters of deep snow in the 1530s. I made a snowman. It was in the shape of the Pope. It was, and I made the Pope's adherents, I suppose the College of Cardinals, as it were. And my snowmen, which were only made for the better setting forth of the King's supremacy, attracted attention and 4,000 people came to see them from the country around. They made their own entertainment in those days. <laughs> and then the local priest and his cronies came to my house, they broke my door down, and I'd been cited for heresy at the bishop's court. <laughs> And I was just enraptured by this, because it seems to me, you know when you read folklore books and there's all that boring stuff about midwinter misrule, and it all seems so synthetic and unlikely, and, and yet suddenly I seem to have run into an instance of it, something incredibly subversive and funny going on that wouldn't have happened except around Christmas. But of course, the man puts his pious gloss on it, that he only did it for good religious reasons. But I, I love these snowmen, and I created a scene in which Cromwell comes home from court a December day in the blue dusk, and there are these strange white mounds shining in the garden, and there's a bonfire. And not only have they made the, the, the Pope and the College of Cardinals, but there's a bonfire, and around the bonfire is dancing most of the members of the household under the um, Fictional character, one fictional character, Christoph, my only invented character, Dick Purser, who kept Cromwell's watchdogs, and who's a real person. And somehow, this idea, the firelight, the snow, the blue dusk, I couldn't have invented it, and yet it seems to take me, well, I hope it will transport the reader right there to that moment of the leaping flames of the snow. Nowhere could I have, have got so close, I think, to the climate of the years, um, that if, if I hadn't come across that snippet. And I think, you know, for me, that, that's, that's the joy of the process. Not that you sit and invent wildly, but that you, some, some, you see the potential of something that did really happen. I wonder, um, when we first started doing um, historical fiction roundups in history today, I got a call from The Economist who were very surprised by this. Um, and I think in many ways it was prompted um, by the quality of Warfall, as well as we were noting also a, a rising other novels, and, and I was quoted as saying that the historical novel was finally respectable. I probably did say that, but I don't really agree, because I think it's been respectable for quite a while, in a sense, although not necessarily with academic historians. I think back to Mary Reno, you've, yeah. already, you've already mentioned Robert Gaines, J.G. Farrell won the Lost Man Booker Prize, Philip Henshaw's made the case for George Hare. Um, um, Patrick, Patrick O'Brien as well. I mean, there are plenty oh, of, yes. of, of these figures. And so I, I just wanted to ask, what it, was it about that moment that Warfall, critical acclaim, everything there, all the reviews that came with that, the nomination uh, for the man booker, but why 
did it capture the imagination that went to be saying? What was it about that moment rather than the book? I, I don't really know whether it was a moment. I think. I think it's Henry VIII's lives. I think they were bank. <laughs> I think it's as simple as that. It appealed to the audience as being authentic. I think mm -hmm. that is the point. Uh, the reconstructed conversations and so on struck a chord with the audience and uh, they believed it effectively. Yes, I, I, I think because it, it is one of the things that I particularly like to do again is if I can weave real lines perhaps, from, you know what is said is often spoken beforehand uh, as in, in a kind of rehearsal. Oh, sorry, what is written is often spoken in a rehearsal. And there's a, get a pleasure again if you can use someone's actual words and yet find a context in which those words can plausibly be spoken um, and find a plausible explanation behind those words. Um, I did that in A Place of Greater Safety my revolution book, but nobody knew. Um, I mean, the, for better or worse, the public is more informed about Tudor history, they care about it more, they think about it more, even if the, some of the information they've got is, is not accurate. It, it is a topic that, well, it's always new to people, it can always be reinvented. I thought maybe I didn't know how little people cared about the French Revolution. <laughs> and my critics, if they read Thomas Carlyle, they thought they were great. And if, I, if what I said wasn't what Carlyle said, then I was obviously wrong. Uh, and uh, yes, yeah, but the whole approach. I think is, is different with the Tudors because we have the popularising historians as well and um, we've had David Starkey's TV series and it's something that in a way everyone has an opinion on. Yeah, and there's also I suppose a substantial framework even if much of it is myth it's still there that one can deal with and play with. Um, much more difficult I think perhaps for uh, or, or perhaps not so difficult in, in a sense, but for say someone who deals with uh, medieval Middle Ages or late antiquity or even earlier than that, where people can be immensely playful. You think of something like the film 300, for instance, going back to films, yes. which plays very, very fast and loose with, with the facts, it has to be said. And yet the otherness of the Persians that is portrayed in it to the Spartans still brings a kind of truth to that. That well, that is the way yeah. that one can imagine that otherness. And everyone approaches this from where they're coming from. Um, so what strikes you as authentic might not strike me as authentic. Um, it does depend to some extent on the background information that you have. I mean, Thomas More, for instance, is largely based on R.W. Chambers. Yes. Uh, Mad for All Seasons yes. was, was written on that basis. And that is the root of the popular perception of Thomas More. He was a nice guy, you know, yes. 1960s liberal or whatever. Exactly, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, and because it was such a superb dramatic artifact, and made not just a brilliant play, but a brilliant film, it has held sway for two generations. And so when I came along with my rather different portrait, Thomas More. People asked me, was I making it up about the heretics, about Tyndale and so on. Um, I, I was quite taken aback when I said, uh, you know, if I, if I was wrong with it. But, you know, again, the, the point I always have to make is historians are aiming at neutrality. They don't always achieve it because they might be ideologically driven. Uh, they might have their own personality even that might be coming between them and their subject, particularly a problem for biographers. But they, but historical novelists are allowed to be partial. 
And it's the partiality that puts the fire into the, in, into the work. Um, so, you know, what I, I tend to say is, look, I have no opinion on Thomas More. What I am trying to do is to represent how Thomas More might have looked if he were Thomas Cromwell. So, I'm not offering an overview. I'm just saying, let us stand at this unfamiliar angle and see how Moore looks, see how Anne Boleyn looks, see how the king looks. And that's really one of the reasons I wanted to write about Cromwell, because it seems that here's a man who's so central, certainly to the decade of the 1530s, and yet, imaginatively, as it were, as an imaginative construct, he doesn't exist. And he doesn't exist in biography, because there are lots of books that say Thomas Cromwell, but what you get inside them is topics. It's not a person. And the reason is the material is not there. Um, his, his personal life is hidden, elided. And yet, the novelist knows, and we all know, everyone has a personal life. So it's a question of building things up from hints and intuitions, really. <coughs> Elton. What hate it, I think. Well, Elton was uh, very hostile to Cromwell, in effect. Mm -hmm. uh, hostile to, um, to Moore. To Moore, yes. And favourable to Cromwell. Uh, but that, that was, I mean, that was where he was coming from. But I think he probably despised biography, really. Did he? No, he never did. He said it was impossible to write a biography of Thomas Cromwell. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, no. Because of the lack of early evidence. Yeah, so it, it brings me back to my original point. Um, second best is you write a novel. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know about that, but it's certainly an alternative approach. Yes. yes. Um, I promised uh, half an hour of questions, um, so uh, I should stick to that. Um, so, does anyone have any questions for Hillary and Dave? Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you to, everyone to shout up as well. Okay. Speak up. And then right, go. yeah. Um, I was very interested that uh, David begins by talking about historians and people. And Harry talks about what I actually do. And I felt almost as if you're, you're, you're planning to be the critic here and you're, you're coming in. But I think there's a, 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 a large area of uh, what well, you're actually sort of saying the same thing. You're both very interested in authenticity. Yes. And you're almost ignoring the huge area of historical fiction which doesn't try to be authentic, which uses history and doesn't have this uh, sense of second best. And I probably the best person to use as an example is, in my opinion, the best historical fiction writer there ever was, William Shakespeare, who does exactly this in simplifying uh, characters. In uh, Henry IV, Part One, he takes Edmund Mortimer and the Earl of March and thinks, well, I can't deal with two Edmund Mortimer's, we'll put them together, and the Earl of March ends up in bed with the young daughter, and there's confusion all over the place. But you can get away with it, because his purposes are, 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 are much bigger than being authentic, and you can get away with it as long as you're a good enough writer. And so there's an area here which is not about authenticity, which is about the possibilities of history, and to learn from the past and go beyond the past in, in, in meanings. And I, I wonder how you react to that. Yes, you. Uh, I mean, the, the, the danger of it with this is that you rewrite the, 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 the history and the fiction of the history is rewritten in the image of the author and the image of the author's period. This was the point that Hillary was making about the, 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 those early novels that she read, which were uh, bits of moral teaching wrapped up in a fictional guise. And um, this is always a problem. Um, but uh, authenticity is extremely important. I mean, you're, you're talking really about my first category of, of, of uh, historical fiction. But it's important to Shakespeare, and he's quite good, you know. Well, he's not a good historian, he's a good writer. <laughs> he, he's made people's names live forever. Yes, uh, that's part of the problem, of course. He's Richard, <laughs> the, he's Richard III will live forever. Um, that bears no relation to the real Richard III, as you probably know. Um, 
But uh, this is, of course, the point that the, the, the good writer of historical fiction, whether it's whether it's William Shakespeare or Hilary Mantel, will always convey an image of a period, an image of people uh, that will stick in the mind, because that is the nature of the exercise, I think. But more so than the case of the historian, who is always equivocating and saying, well, it may have been so. Uh, according to one source, it was this. According to another source, it was the other. And this is the kind of equivocation which I've gone on for all my life, so I hope it's about it. But it doesn't present the kind of thumping uh, uh, ideal that you're talking about. No, it doesn't. Yes, I, I think, um, well, I wonder, you know, Richard III, I think Thomas More's biography has yeah, something yes. to do with Shakespeare's <laughs> perception. Um, playwrights, they've got two and a half, three hours. Um, it's, there's, a, there's a reason why they do things they do. I think the novelist should be held to a strict standard. I take your point absolutely, but I think people tend to use Shakespeare as a kind of excuse, as a kind of get out clothes. You know, if he said, actually, you're dead wrong, oh, Shakespeare did the same thing. But of course, the answer is you are not Shakespeare. <laughs> um, we can't. Um, it, it does depend. Of course, it usually depends on what you you set out to do, and on what is actually knowable. What resources you have. Um, if I were to, I mean, my responsibility creating, as it were, recreating Tudors is far greater than if I were writing about an era, say, 200 years earlier, where evidence of private lives would be so scanty. But when the record is there and it is available to you, I don't think there's an excuse for ignoring it or willfully um, walking away and saying, I'm going to take the erotic license because Shakespeare did. <laughs> Next question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question is um, just for Hillary, but of course I would love to hear anyone else's opinion as well. Um, I liked your talk very, very much, so thank you very much. Um, I especially liked um, what you had to say about the history of ideas playing a prominent role in what you do. Um, and I would like to ask a sort of general question related to that, and a slightly more specific one. Um, first, I was wondering if you might say just a little bit more about the role that intellectual history and the history of ideas might play in your work. Um, and then second, and off of that, sort of the idea of, of concepts, because um, of course intellectual historians take very seriously the idea that concepts and their, the normative weight that they carry changes over time. Um, and so when it comes to creating dialogue or working with concepts, um, would you prefer to use the word, the vocabulary of the time, or something that more closely carries our current normative weight so that the reader understands what's going on? Um, uh, sorry, sorry. Did, did everyone hear that? Yes, um, <laughs> um, just basically, just, just a, I suppose a technical question about the use of words, whether anachronisms in there or, or judgment on uh, the use of anachronisms or not. I think that, again, it's something that every writer of historical fiction makes a judgment on very early, right there in the first line of their book. Um, in what language, in whose language do you tell this story? Depends what you like. I hate pastiche. Um, and I am not trying to uh, reproduce period language in any sense. I am trying to create an idiom into which I can slide a contemporary quotation without you seeing the join. So, say for what for, it's not straightforward contemporary English. 
It's something just nudged a little bit aside. Um, and I drove my copy editor mad by sometimes using the word impossible, where we would say impossible. But you know, it was my little nod to William Tyndale, with God shall nothing be impossible. Um, you don't have to know that if it sticks out on the page as an oddity and it strikes your ear as, as, as being God. And I like to just shift language sideways sometimes to give the reader a little nudge like that. But the important thing, as you say, is the ideas behind the words. I try not, well, I, I try very hard not to have my people use um, words or concepts that they would not have. And I try to not let them express ideas they couldn't have. But of course, the way you handle the history of ideas, the evolution of ideas in a novel, you have to think hard here about your responsibility to history, but also your responsibility as a novelist. It seems to me that largely novels about ideas are dead on the page. Uh, what what you, you tend to have is uh, rhetoric with inverted commas around it. Novels have to be about people. It's a situation of the people that has to carry the story. So you make an accommodation. You have to find a, a dramatic expression for an evolving idea. Yes, um, this question of language is a question which the popular historian also faces. And the, the question arises of, of uh, transliterating quotations from 16th century sources, shall we say, into a, into a, a modern format, uh, which is a standard practice in popular history. You don't reproduce uh, the, uh, the format of the, original, of the original quotation, usually. You modernize it. And in modernising, you can occasionally slip into an anachronism. Uh, there's something that a popular historian has to be aware of, as well as the, uh, as well as the writer of historical fiction, because this is an area in which there is a certain degree of overlap. Uh, the difference is um, that in the case of the popular historian, the quotation itself is basically authentic, whereas in the case of the writer of historical fiction, it may not be. Yes. I, I'm, I'm having a bad conscious, conscience now. I'm thinking I was unduly harsh in my answer to the previous question when I was talking to Ian. I, I just want to make one thing clear. That I, as a writer, cannot prescribe for other writers. I, I would hate to say they must do this. They cannot do that. Uh, this is the proper way to do it. I can only tell you what I do, and I can only tell you what pleases me or offends me in other people's work. Um, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I was just going to say there was an example of, of this um, use of idiomatic language and the choices that, uh, that writers have, because I, I know that you use um, such words as God's blood, um, mm. blood, blood of, uh, by the mass. Uh, you, you nudge it along slightly from the from, from the idiom then. In Deadwood, um, the HBO series, which was set in a 19th century uh, pioneer town, they decided that using religious oaths for in a secular age um, would not work. It simply wouldn't have the impact. So instead of that, they used, although it was set in the 19th century, they used um, what the BBC often euphemistically called very strong language there, <laughs> because it would have the impact and that yes. I suppose is the writer's choice. I, I had a letter from a man who said that he quite liked my book, but for the second one would I please clean up my language? <laughs> <laughs> and this was what he was objecting to, blasphemy. Um, and oh, I have to say, well, I'm sorry, but that's my characters. <laughs> I'm not responsible. <laughs> Those are at the forefront of this kind of anachronism, aren't they? <laughs> you said? Yeah. 
It seems to me that this is one of the problems right at the heart of historical fiction. What, how do you make your historical characters speak? What language do you give uh, for them? Um, it seems to me also that most historical novelists have had this problem. You go right back to Walter Scott, for instance, uh, who is writing for an early 19th century audience. He has to make the historical speech comprehensible to that audience, or else nobody will be able to read his books, or, or the books won't sell. Uh, and since he's trying to communicate important things through the medium of historical fiction, it's important that he does get the language straight. In fact, he writes about this in his prefaces. I think in the preface to Ivanhoe, in particular, he discourses at some length about what speech shall I give my medieval characters. Well, fortunately, uh, these medieval characters that he's writing about speak English. But you take, for instance, George Eliot's Romola, where uh, the characters are in uh, late 15th century Florence, she has to try and devise a convincing way in English writing for a mid-19th century audience to convey how Florentines would have spoken. And this is a great problem. It, it's right at the heart of her book. She doesn't really master how to do this, and she knows it. It's a great problem for her as a writer. And so there's a glossary at the end of it of uh, Italian words uh, and English translations of Italian words. What well, even more problematic is Flaubert's Salambo. He is writing for a mid-19th uh, century French audience, but how do you find out how uh, 3rd century BC Carthaginians actually spoke to one another, <laughs> and then convey that to 19th century French? You have to do it, however. If you're writing a historical novel, this is what you have to do. Uh, you may not succeed, he doesn't entirely succeed, but this is the task that the historical novelist sets him or herself. And I think the end result, as Scott foresaw, is that you have to make a serious compromise. You're writing for the people of now, and yet you mustn't use things which are blatantly modernisms. You have somehow to devise a spoken language, no matter what language your characters actually spoke, Greek, Punic, or whatever, uh, which uh, is immediately comprehensible to the 19th, 20th, and 20th, 21st century reader. <laughs> I think you said it all. This is a problem. Um, but by what standard shall we measure our success or failure? Because if we invent an idiom for historical characters, until we come into the era of recording devices, no one can prove us wrong. Um, what we have is the written record, which is quite different from the way people spoke which we can only imagine. Yes, I mean, I think the, the, the point is that the, the, the concepts, the content of what is said has got to be contemporary with the, the period of the novel. The way in which it is said has got to be comprehensible to the modern audience. Uh, so you've got a, a compromise, in a sense, between the content and the presentation. Um, it's a very important that the content should not contain a lot of anachronisms, I agree. Um, but the language which is used has got to be unashamedly the language of your own time. And, and this, you see, is where the queasiness comes in for the historical fictionalizer. Because you approach this question, just take this question for instance, and you know there is no standard, as I said, against which to measure your success or failure. You, you know that you are, in fact, you often know you are not being authentic. 
Because if I were to have my tutors speaking as they probably did speak to each other, they would be your majesty and my lord in every other sentence. Or we would never get anywhere at all. <laughs> uh, the first chapter would occupy a thousand pages. So, you know, you adopt a convention. Um, at the beginning of their meeting, they my lord each other, and then they drop it. And, you know, it's just a tiny, for instance, of how you make life possible for yourself. Um, it's, it's not authenticity. It's plausibility. That's, that's the point. That, that's what, what we've got to aim at. Um, you know, there is a, a problem, a central problem, for historical novels. And that, I'm surprised they ever satisfy anyone. Because the historian will say, well, why did she leave that out? Or why doesn't she mention so-and-so? Whereas the literary critic will say, what is all this stuff about the oath of supremacy? Or, you know, whatever's the issue. Does she really need this? Or why does she have so many characters? <laughs> uh, and, and why uh, couldn't this, these two episodes be pulled together into a more satisfactory dramatic shape? And the answer is yes, but they won't be true. <laughs> and I think you pinpointed something very important, um, that we are constantly trying to drag some sort of plausible and satisfactory result out of a process which is inherently unstable from moment to moment. So as I see it, every line is a negotiation. Next question. Um, we were hearing at the very beginning that a conference like this probably wouldn't have taken place 15 or 20 years ago, and your earliest um, historical novel writing got rather criticised by historians, less so now. Have we moved into a period where, in general, historians and novelists equally are more concerned with historical authenticity than they used to be? See, while, while during the conversation I've been jotting down all sorts of names from way, way back, Scott, um, Schiller, um, Charles Lawton's Henry VIII and the Chicken Bone, I mean, all sorts of things over the last two or three hundred years where the history is obviously false, which didn't bother people. Um, Shakespeare's obviously been mentioned, uh, War and Peace, Victor Hugo, and so on. Today, Hillary very impressively is concerned with the accuracy of the history. Have we become more accurately, historiographically conscious in very recent times so that a conference of this kind could take place? Yes, I, I think, you know, when my, I wrote my first historical novel, I held myself to the, standard, the same standard as I held myself to in Wolf Hall. And it wasn't so much that, the his, that historians criticised it, it was that they put a peg on their notes as it walked <laughs> off in the other direction. And um, since then, yes, it has changed. What is really interesting is, is how they throw those old kind of novels, basically aimed uh, fairly low pitched aimed at a female market, they grind on, and I'm amazed that they persist. Um, but that has nothing to do with what some of the authors we've named have tried to do. I mean, people like Barry Unsworth is a name we, we haven't mentioned, who um, is, is, is probably less concerned with real characters, although he did write a wonderful book about Nelson, but brilliant at realising uh, atmosphere that Carl, um, you know what Blair would call the atmospheric pressure of events. Uh, his, his book Morality Play is, is you know, a, a little gem about a troop of medieval players. Now, these novels have been coming out quietly for a period of 20 years, I would have said. 
And now, at last, it's as if in the last two years, everyone's opened their eyes and said, historical fiction doesn't have to be the dos end of the market. Uh, we have become, as we've all abandoned the grand narrative, we have become more historiographically aware. It's amazing to me that people are still writing without that awareness, but there is a market for them to write to. Um, his, would, it be, would it be fair to say that historians have become more sophisticated in their response to literature as novelists have become more Yes, I think, I, think, I think that is true. Um, I mean, I, I do think that historians have become more aware of the, of the literary heritage and so on over the last few years. Um, I was going to say I blame it all on 1066 and all that, um, but uh, I think you know what I mean, the development of a general historical consciousness. I think maybe the contemplation of the past becomes more attractive as the contemplation of the present becomes less attractive. <laughs> the contemplation of the future doesn't stand up at all. Um, but there is certainly a, the, the fact that uh, popular history has paved the way, I think, for a, a great upsurge in, the, in the, the evaluation of historical fiction. Um, I mean, I'm reminded of the fact that somebody like Sir Geoffrey Elton made a lot of money out of England under the Tudors a generation ago. Uh, and that was an academic work after all, and, um, but it, it struck a popular chord. Maybe the schooling that people obtained 20, 30 years ago uh, was also somewhat to blame for the increasing awareness of history. I wouldn't go down that road where the education is at the moment, but uh, uh, when, when I was in school, um, this was the sort of thing that one did in, in, in history lessons. And uh, well, so that's going back a long way now, I agree. And, and commerce is important as well, because I mean, there's, yes. there does seem as if, as if some if, if one looks at the best-selling um, historians, a pretty serious history as well, like Simon Seabrook Montefiore, <coughs> Amanda Foreman, Anthony Beaver, Simon uh, Sharma, Simon Charmer, mm -hmm. and all of them journalistic in a way. They've all learned how to write, how to present a narrative, and yet, ask, and yet remain or, or aspire to be serious historians and certainly connect with the public in the same way that Hillary has, and, and some huge ones. Um, and also, I think there has been, there's a certain strength, particularly young historians, very talented young historians. I'm thinking in mind of people like Maya Yassenhoff with her book um, Liberty's Exiles, and Victoria Harris with Modern Romantics, who cross over between history and English and are very good at characterization. Yes. Um, and uh, so I think there probably is some influence at the higher end of the historical novel and the higher end of academic history. But certainly, if you want to find a public, whatever you're writing about, it helps if you can write well. <laughs> and I think a lot of historians actually forget that. Yeah. Indeed, academic historians notoriously write very badly. <laughs> um, I think we can have one more question. Me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I found this very interesting and some, in some ways alarming. <laughs> Which is, uh, I'm sure will bode well for tomorrow's discussion as well. I think my question is, is, is for Hilary Mantel. I, I, I did love what you said about the novel and, and your practices. Um, but I was a, I'm a little worried about this sort of, uh, the, the way in which the female audience um, becomes a kind, of, a, a kind of encoded word for a degraded form of historical fiction. I mean, without, without women readers and targeted even women readers, a great deal of the fiction that we now value hugely uh, wouldn't exist. So I, I wondered if you could talk a little more about, uh, you know, about why, uh, what's wrong with that? I mean, if I'm thinking of Sarah Walters' novel, I know you don't like pastiche, but they're more than pastiche, uh, the, the Victorian trilogy. In some measure, one might say those novels are, uh, you know, have a primary audience of women readers uh, and so forth. Uh, and there are always primary audience. Indeed, the novel has a primary audience in some ways of women readers. So I, I just like to just... I'm not talking about authors like Sarah Walters. <laughs> I was talking about the, the 50s, 60s, um, 
the kind of book that I, I, I you know, I would say you always have some woman with a heaving bosom and a hemming on the, on the cover. And later you could tell them because they had gold foil. <laughs> and they were usually called wife to cook back or something like that, with wife spelled with Y in it. <laughs> um, what was wrong with these books is as entertainment, nothing. As history, everything. Because they were really lazy. They were unexamined school book history. Parcels of prejudice passed from one generation to another. And what they did was they removed all controversy, all thought from history, all examination of questions of authenticity. They were little just so stories. They were parables. Um, they, I mean, you look at novels about Henry and his wives, you know. Um, they, were, they were working from archetypes. They, they were, as I say, teaching vehicles about women's lives. Anne Boleyn, right, don't go stealing other people's husbands. They'll cut your head off and you'll deserve it. <laughs> um, Jane Seymour, don't go stealing other people's husbands. You'll die in childbirth. Uh, God will get you. Um, it seemed to me they were, they were pernicious. And what amazes me is that when you have the new historical fiction that we've been talking about tonight, that novels are still published that are essentially in this tradition, but you will not get me to name names, <laughs> even if you stand me in boiling oil. <laughs> Don't be too hard on the historical fiction of the 1950s and 1960s. Man on a Donkey was written at that time. Indeed. <laughs> and, and a Mary Reno as yeah. well yes. was yeah. a wonderful author because her people did not think like us. Mm. She could do the essential thing. We might not have a lot of information, a hard solid, solid information about those people's lives, but she penetrated an alien mentality, and yet she did not forfeit the reader's sympathy for her characters. And that is, I think, something every historical novelist should aim at. Yes. And Man on a Donkey, is, as you say, you have the era breathing through it. Yes, it's, it, yes it, it's, it's a wonderful novel. Um, do you know what strikes me about that? It's the cup called Matthew. Yeah. The cup that has a name, yes. um, not the sort of thing you could make up. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Hilary. Thank you, David. No, thank you, everyone, for that. Um, and uh, I think we have drinks and a reception now, and possibly all to continue for a while. So, thank you very much. <laughs>